Well, hi. Welcome to another study in Joshua. This is our fifth in the series. And in this lesson, we're going to be looking at Israel's crossing Jordan. This is chapter four, uh, all 24 verses that we're going to be able to look at. Uh, we won't probably cover every single verse, but uh, we're going to get there and, and take a peek at most of them anyway. And I just want to read at least the first three verses to get us started. So let's get going in Joshua and Joshua chapter four, Israel's crossing Jordan and see what we can find. And it came to pass when all the people were clean passed over Jordan, that the Lord spake unto Joshua saying, take you 12 men out of the people, out of every tribe, a man, and command ye them, saying, Take ye hence out of the midst of Jordan, out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm, twelve stones, and ye shall carry them over with you, and leave them in the lodging place where she, ye shall lodge this night. Years ago, in fact, I know I've preached on this passage a couple different times, not in a series, but as a separate sermon. And it was, I don't even remember, it might have been many as 30 years ago when I first preached on this, because all my children were pretty small. But we took a little adventure. I grabbed them all in preparation for this sermon and loaded them up in my truck. And we took off up in the hills and we were going to find 12 big stones. And we loaded them up in the truck and then brought them into the church and to the facilities, I should say, where the church meets. And we put them in the back of the auditorium. And we had 12 different men that were chosen. And during that service, uh, those 12 men, each one at a time, got up, grabbed the stone, and brought it up to the front of the auditorium, all to make a point and an illustration that we used. Uh, now, that original sermon, someone, of course, broke into my uh, office one day and stole all of my messages. They were on digital form back then. And so I don't have that, but the truth is still lodged here. Well, we're going to enjoy some very serious looks at look at each of the points in this. And we're going to see some things. Number one, we're going to see a significant speech. Number two, we're going to see some significant stones. Number three, we're going to see a significant spot. Number four, we're going to see a significant sign. Number five, we're going to see a significant shrine. And number six, we're going to see a significant soul or significant souls, plural. And we'll explain each of those as we go along. The speech, the stones, the spot, the sign, the shrine, and the souls. So let's get started again in looking, first of all, at the significant speech. God has already spoken to Joshua that we read. And then we're going to go down to verse 4 and verse 5, where he says, Then Joshua called the twelve men whom he had prepared of the children of Israel, out of every tribe of man. And Joshua said unto them, Pass over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of Jordan, and take ye up every man of you a stone upon his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel. The first thing that you notice is that this was a command of God. But as we progress through this, you're also going to see a commendation of uh, God uh, upon this. But I want to, before we get there, I started to go a little bit too fast. Joshua was faithful to speak all that God had commanded him to speak to Israel. And he had prepared and appointed these particular men, one out of every tribe. Now, same thing, prior to my having the 12 men uh, carry those stones, I spoke to them beforehand and instructed them what they were going to do and then uh, appointed them to do this. I prepared them for what they were going to do. And that's what Joshua did. He prepared these men according to the command of God. Now, I clicked it already, but now you'll see it in Joshua chapter 4 and verse 10. It says, For the priests which bear the ark stood in the midst of Jordan 
until everything was finished that the Lord commanded Joshua to speak unto the people, according to all that Moses commanded Joshua. And the people hasted and passed over. Now, when I look at this, I notice something else beside it being a command of God, everything that God had commanded Joshua and everything that uh, Moses from God had commanded Joshua. But I also notice what I was mentioning a while ago is the commendation of God. God had an order that he had given to Moses and Moses to Joshua. And so Joshua was following his duty. He led them across Jordan. And if you look at it, they obeyed the Lord. And you notice how they obeyed? And they, according to all that Moses commanded Joshua and the people, hasted and passed over. They did it in haste. In other words, they did it promptly. They were they're given a command. They did not delay and they did not modify their behavior. They obeyed what God commanded them. If you want to live a successful Christian life, folks, you need not delay. If God commands you to do something, get up and do it. We cannot wait for a more convenient time, and we must not attempt to modify God's commands. What do we think when we hear a command of God? Do you wonder about when you should respond or how you would, should respond? A lot of times people will say, oh, I know I should, but we've always got something that causes us to hesitate, kind of like when the Lord had called uh, three different men in the book of Luke. One had to go bury his uh, father. Another had to go check his land out. You know, I'll follow you, but just just wait. Well, we talked about the significant speech. It's a command of God. And a lot of times do we hear that significant speech as a command of God? Or are we very casual about it? Do we pick and choose what we want to hear? Listen, you want to cross Jordan in the right way into the successful, prosperous Christian life? See it as a significant speech that God is giving you a command and you'll get the commendation as well. We also mentioned that these were significant stones. Let's look at Joshua chapter 4, verses 5 and 7. We already read some of this, but it said, Joshua said unto them, Pass over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of Jordan, and take ye up every man of you a stone upon his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, that this may be a sign among you, that when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean ye by these stones? Then ye shall answer them that the waters of Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when it passed over Jordan. The waters of Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be for a memorial unto the children of Israel forever. You know, you look back through the scriptures, it's interesting how often God has used the word stone or a rock to illustrate Christ throughout scripture. There's the rock in Horeb that Israel drank from in the Old Testament. And in that dispensation, it was a picture of Jesus Christ. First Corinthians 10 and 4 tells us that rock was Christ. Daniel tells us about the prophecy of Christ in his millennial reign. And he is said in Daniel 2 and 34 to be the stone which was cut out without hands. He's later described in that very same chapter, the next verse, the stone which became a great mountain and filled the earth. In Isaiah 28, he's called a tried stone, a precious cornerstone. In Ephesians 2 and 20, he's the chief cornerstone. In Romans, a rock of offense, a stumbling stone. And upon those who will fall upon it, they will be broken. Jesus himself described himself as the rock upon which he would build his church in Matthew 16. Jesus is the stone that the rebuilders rejected and, of course, has become the head of the corner. Even Christians are considered to be as lively stones or a lively, living, excuse me, spiritual building where God is worshipped in spirit and in truth. 
In most, if not all of these illustrations, you get the word picture very clearly that God is drawing for us when he uses the idea of stones and a very significant stones. Well, these 12 stones, I think they had a distinct and very intentional purpose and message and something that we can be encouraged for. What mean ye these stones? Well, for us, we can see something I think to be encouraged by it is number one, they were sanctified stones. All they were were stones. All they were was rock come up out of a river. What made them significant is that they were chosen by God. They were set apart. Of course, the people had a part, those men did, in picking them up. But it was for not just them that they were picking these stones out, but it was for the children who were not there now and who had not been there at this event and had seen it. Remember what's going to happen when your children ask. This wasn't something that was of man's design or some great invention that man came up with. This was a command directly from God. And God said these were significant stones because they were set apart for him. But they were also set stones. In other words, they were stones to be removed from one place and set in a certain place. God told him to pick out 12 men, one representing each tribe, and each were to grab a stone from a very significant spot. We'll mention that later. And of course, all of this was to provoke questions. No placard, no words, just 12 stones. That's all. Purposely piled up. The stone was big enough, if you remember too, it had to be carried on the shoulder. But it wasn't built into a fire pit. It wasn't a resting place. It wasn't built into a bench. It wasn't designed or fitted with gold or silver. It was just 12 stones to, made to provoke questions. All of these simple stones were made significant to, to me, the great lesson is, you're a stone. You're a sanctified. You're just a person. You're nothing special. You're plucked out of the river of man, but you're different because God has chosen you. And God has not only chosen you, but he's set you in a particular place. God has chosen you to be a witness for him. God made these simple stones significant just like he makes you significant. He set these stones in a special place just like he sets us in a special place with a special purpose. Maybe your children ask, why do you go to church every Sunday? Why do you worship to, and tell others people about Jesus Christ? Why do you feel the need, mom and dad, to give? Why do you serve? Because God has chosen us and made us separate from all others. We are set apart for his purpose in this place. They were significant stones. I already mentioned though too, it was a significant spot. Notice with me in verse three, what does he say? And he commanded them saying, take you hence out of the midst of the Jordan out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm. So there was a very significant spot that he wanted them to come from. And there was a very significant spot where he wanted to leave them. Leave them in the lodging place where you shall lodge this night. Now, probably like most places, it would soon become a forgotten place. One that would never be seen again. In fact, we know to some degree it became a hidden place. But these 12 stones represented the promise of God to all of Israel, to the 12 tribes. And it represented the fact of God's covenant that he would give them this land. He promised to enable them to drive out the, the current inhabitants and make this land their property by divine right. The place of crossing, though they might not 
ever remember all of the things, this place was never to be forgotten. It was always going to have a reminder there. Well, what significant spot can you think about in your life? Do you remember when you were saved? Do you remember where your sins were forgiven? I mean, I know they were forgiven in eternity. I know they were forgiven by God in heaven. But I can remember very well the place where I fell on my knees before God. I can remember the time in which God saved my soul. At least I became aware of it. I can remember where my sins were forgiven and where I praised God and where the smile came on my face that I no longer had the fear of my condemnation, but I had the joy of being saved. That in my mind is always going to be a significant spot. But there was another time in my life too and maybe there is with you, it's not only that we can remember where we were saved, but maybe there was a time in your life where you can remember where you were sanctified and your heart was changed forever. Maybe it wasn't just the fact you'd been saved for a while, but God got a hold of you. God did something to you. For me, it was when I was called to preach. I can remember very distinctly where I was at. I can remember who was preaching. I can remember the thoughts that were going through my mind. There were a lot of things, and there are probably some things in your life when you were saved and when you were sanctified that you can remember when your sins were forgiven and you can remember when your heart was changed forever. The occasions and spots where it happened were significant. They are significant to you. They will forever remain significant. You might even, while I'm saying all these things, remember that little church that you were saved in. Or you remember the very pew. Or I remember kneeling beside my bed. I remember the person who led me to the Lord. I remember the spot where God touched me and changed me forever. I remember that invitation song. I can remember. What can you remember? It became a significant spot for you. Then we'll notice something else, not only a significant spot, but a significant sign. Look with me at verses five and six, where Joshua said unto them, pass over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of Jordan and take you up every man of you a stone upon his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel. Why? That this may be a sign among you that when your children ask their fathers in time to come saying, what mean ye by these stones? That was my whole sermon when the first time I entered into this particular passage. But these stones were designed to do something. They were designed as a sign. What was the sign? They were to provoke questions. The children would ask, what do these stones mean? Well, not only would they provoke questions, but they would provide answers. The parents were told, Tell them it's a sign among you to provoke questions from every succeeding generation. And they were given then an opportunity to rehearse that particular answer of what took place. The parents could rehearse the facts about the water of the Jordan River being cut off, held up by God. It was to point them to the fact of the divine powers of that they had a miraculous God. There was a, they were told about the Ark of the Covenant and the priest who carried it, how the waters had stopped and heaped up when the priests, all miraculous, as a wonderful story. Think about again when we get to tell our children, what are you doing when you're taking the Lord's Supper? What are those people doing when they're being baptized in the water and they're being immersed? What great signs do we have as a memorial today that we can point our children to? That a lot of times children, well, can I partake of the fruit of the vine? Can I partake of that bread? Well, not yet. Why not? 
It gives you a great opportunity to tell your children about Jesus Christ. We get to share with them the greatest miracle that anybody ever knows. And that is the miracle of salvation, the miracle of having Christ save us from our sins and promise us eternal life with him forever. They could tell their children about the Lord God and his miraculous power, and we can do the same thing. What a significant sign. But I want to remind you, there was something else there too. There was a significant shrine. Now, there were 12 other stones, if you notice, back in this passage. They went, those 12 men took 12 stones out of the river. But then they were supposed to go back in and take 12 stones right where the priests were and make a memorial in the midst of the Jordan River. Look at this with me in verse 9. And Joshua set up 12 stones in the midst of Jordan in the place where the feet of the priests which bear the Ark of the Covenant stood, and they are there to this day. This was the place where Israel saw the proof of God's power and the proof of God's divine presence and purpose. This was a memorial of God's overcoming power. By that, I mean that here was his irresistible power, how that God could change nature in a heartbeat. Remember those waters steeped up, they heaped up, they stopped, they dried up, and they were able to walk across on dry ground. But it's in the midst of the river. I'm sure at times that may have hidden the stones, where at other times when the Jordan was lower, the stones stuck up out of the river. Someone has once said that John the Baptist, when he was preaching and he talked about the stones that God could make them speak out and that he was at that very spot and those stones were still there and he was pointing to them. I don't know that that's the case at all, but I'm going to tell you, if ever the river ran low, this memorial would show up. If you and I ever run low on spiritual energy, and sometimes we can get despondent, we can fail in our walk. We have a significant shrine that may have long been forgotten, and God will remind us we have a memorial of God's overcoming power. He saved us not only from the condemnation of sin, but he has saved us from the power of sin. And one day we're going to be saved from the presence of sin. This significant shrine was not only a more memorial of God's overcoming power, but it was a memorial of God's overwhelming power. Have you ever felt God's overwhelming power? I'm talking about here where God overwhelms us with his infinite, vast power. This is a time where like Israel saw the proof of God's power. We saw it in our own lives, something that took place in us. What a powerful sight it must have been for them as each one of them marched past the Ark of the Covenant. Remember, the Ark of the Covenant went first. Those priests just stepped into the brink, the water stopped, and then followed on. Every Israelite would have opportunity to look over and see the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God, the power of God, the purpose of God. Oh, how rich and how wonderful that you and I probably have some hidden significant shrine in our life. We've never told anybody how God saved us from something. There's something there that's so personal, but yet it's so powerful. It's hidden in our heart, but you know it. And God knows that then the Holy Spirit will sometimes bring that to light. And it's just a memorial of God's overcoming and overwhelming 
power. Lastly, I want to share with you about some significant souls. Not S-O-U-L-S, but the souls of the priest. Look with me, if you will, at verse 18. What he says here, And it came to pass, when the priests that bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord were come up out of the midst of the Jordan, and the soles of the priest's feet were lifted up unto the dry land, that the waters of Jordan returned unto their place and flowed all over here, or over all his banks, as they did before. That's how we know this whole area was flooded. Do you realize how significant these men, these priests' feet were? When they stepped into the brink, when the soles of their feet stepped into the brink of the Jordan, the water stopped. And when their soles reached the ground that was normally dry, the water started going again. The soles of their feet were very significant. That's the marker that God used to stop the water and to start the water. What can we say about that for ourselves? I can sit here and tell you, Christian, that you have significant feet. You know, the Bible tells us that you do. If you're saved, if you're born again, dear friend, the soles of your feet are significant. When you walk with God, the power of God is upon you and with you. Do you realize, Christian, that you yourself, Peter tells us, have been made priest? And you, my dear friend, carry the gospel on your shoulders. That's the presence of God. You are commissioned to spread the gospel and be a witness wherever you stand and wherever you walk. I'll tell you that the soles of your feet, number one, they are beautiful. The beauty of your feet is because that God has given you the gospel. Romans 10 and 15 says, How shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Oh, my dear friend Christian, when someone tells you you're not worth much, that you don't matter much, let me tell you, your feet are beautiful. Ah, uh, I won't even tell you. I've got a friend, I think, his feet are ugly. Looking. But his feet are the most beautiful because I've never heard anybody preach the gospel like he does, nor do, have I heard anyone that will share the gospel as often and more to everyone that he meets. He has got, because of that, the most beautiful feet because he carries the gospel. Let me tell you, it's not only that your feet are beautiful, but can I tell you, your feet are powerful? Oh, the Bible, my dear friend, in Romans chapter 16 and verse 20, tells us that our feet have power. 16 and 20 says, And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. In the close of that book, he's talking about how that their witness as a New Testament church, our witness as a New Testament church and as a Christian is a powerful witness. And we can stamp out Satan by preaching and reaching lost souls for Jesus Christ. We get to break through the gates of hell and snatch them out. Oh, the power of your feet are fantastic. Your witness is a powerful and a perpetual memorial. Let me just end with this. Before the memorial comes, there's the unbeatable battle. Before the dry ground comes, there's the raging flood. If we do not have a battle or a raging flood, 
then there's really no need of a miracle, is there? And there's no need of a memorial. Without us being enslaved to sin, there'd be no need of redemption, but we were slaves to sin. Without the struggle, there'd be no need of deliverance and no need of the land of liberty. We wouldn't appreciate it, but we do. The beauty of your feet is that you bring the message of peace and of liberty through Jesus Christ. The power of your feet is that you can smash the strength of the devil by leading others to Jesus Christ. There is coming a time when Satan's forces will be ups absolutely and utterly vanquished and victory will be ours. But until then, we need these memorials to remind us of the power and the perpetual promise of God to be with us always, even to the end of the age. In Psalm 114 and verse 7, it says, Jordan was driven back. Tremble, thou earth, at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob. And I remind you of what Romans says, if God be for us, who can be against us? We've crossed Jordan. Let's keep going. There's significance to these stones. I pray the Lord's blessings on you.